Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. everyone. Welcome to Junior Downs The Spark. Thank you for joining us. Today I will be speaking with Stuart Johnson, the 13th head of school at Tuxedo Park School in Tuxedo Park, New York. So Stuart, thrilled to have this opportunity to talk with you. Um, and a uh, headmaster or head of school, what are the responsibilities that delegate to that position? Well, it, a lot depends, I think, on the size of the school and, and its character, but I think there are a few common things. First of all, you have to satisfy yourself in some way that all the small things are being taken care of, um, because if you don't, someone will hit you with them. Uh, if you don't think of themselves, those things as being part of your job description, so you have to make sure that supplies are there and the buses are running on time and the food is edible, that sort of thing. Um, the bigger thing, of course, I think, is to make sure that everybody feels part of a community. Uh, that, when I say everybody, I mean not, of course, not just teachers and students, of course, but all the people around them who also help. That that would be parents. That would be the members of the administration and staff. Uh, making a, a, giving everybody a feeling that we are all in a common enterprise, which is supposed to be two things. One is the, the growth and development and welfare of the children who are in your care. But then the second is, uh, I think, the sense of purpose of the school. People often like to talk about mission. Uh, and that's a pretty serious word. It almost, it, it almost has religious overtones. But I think the most important thing is to make sure people understand what the school stands for and what it's trying to do, uh, which is not just to get children into college or into the next school but to make sure they learn certain things and have certain values, um, codes of conduct and, and principles, I think. How do you create that sense of community with such disparate people in it? Well, if you're lucky, the school has it to begin with and you come in and you inflect it here and there in small ways, but there are lots of ways to communicate to your students, your, your, your colleagues and the staff and administration, your parents, what's important. Um, there can be assemblies at which people make presentations or, or do certain, can perform certain ritual events. And those I think are very good for bringing people together. Um, ways in which you write or speak to greater members of the community and bringing in alumni, people who understand the school's past and can help it as it goes into the future. Uh, you, you get lots of other people to echo the things that, that you think are most important about a school. You emphasize those things in its traditions and in its present that I, you think are most important and most formative. And you have fun doing and it. And what are these currently? Uh, at which school? At Tuxedo Park? Or yeah, Tuxedo? Both. Any. Both and both. So how, do, how does a parent choose a school? Well, that's, that's a, a separate question, but I, I meant in terms of values. Yeah. Because well, to me, I'm going to ask you, fair warning here, I'm going to ask you, you've been in education a really long time and a head of school for a really long time. So how have the expectations changed or the values changed, the society changed? And how does that reverberate in the school? What a good question. <clears throat> I hope that the first thing a prospective parent will do is come to see the school in action because really that's the way you understand the values best, I think. Uh, you, you watch students and teachers carrying on together. And I think from that, you get a real sense of spontaneity and a sense of whether this is a place that would suit your child. Is this a place, would you like the way the learning is going on? Do you like the relations among the students and between the students and the teachers and the coaches, uh, that sort of thing? 
I think I think that's those are really the most important ways. Uh, we wouldn't be human if we didn't look to our peers probably for what we think of as the most persuasive or convincing uh, assessment of a place. So you will want to hear from other parents, I expect, if this has been a good school for their children, if it's teaching them well, if it's treating them well, um, if they've handled difficult situations deftly. Uh, those are all very important too. Uh, how has it changed? Well, I do think that we are seeing a lot more emphasis perhaps on the things outside the academic curriculum. People want to know a lot more about what else goes on at the school that would be important. I think they also want to see how it connects to the community and the world at large right now. Uh, that's become, I think, an extremely important matter for, for parents and as it is for, as it is for all of us. Um, I thought one of the advantages or of a private school is they had uh, the ability or the choice or the freedom to at least somewhat develop a curriculum for their school. But I'm, I'm just reading in the, that New York is on the verge of changing that. So, or intensifying the role of the state. Um, was there freedom or more freedom, less freedom? Is that an issue? I would say no. Uh, the, in, in law, the New York State Board of Regents has tremendous power. It can dispose of a great many things and a great many different kinds of institutions. The regents, after all, go back to George II, I think, um, King George II. In, in theory, they can, they can say, they have a lot to say about what schools do and don't do. In practice, they have proved mostly willing to let independent schools um, police themselves so long as they have a good organization that does the accreditation and, and uh, make sure that the schools are doing their jobs properly. There are occasional mutterings or rumblings about the states wanting to insert itself more. But by and large, the, the state is, is willing to let parochial schools and private schools um, do their business on their own. So I grew up a time when honor, the concept of honor, that is to say self-control, <laughs> that held your behavior to a higher standard than the law was a concept uh, uh, to be taught and to be learned. And I think that's faded out. What has replaced it or has it been replaced? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, uh, honor to me is a very important thing. And it is something that in old fashioned schools, you may not say explicitly, you may not use that word, but I think it's quite implicit that you do, you do something in a way that, that is honorable. Um, the school song of St. Bernard's School and the school hymn ends do honor to St. Bernard's School. Now that does sound pretty old fashioned in this day and age, doesn't it? Um, I think the, I think the principles that may have replaced it, at least in the minds of many people, are um, what you do for your community, and the community can be small. It can be your your class. It can be your the school itself. It can be your neighborhood, uh, and it could be much greater. It can be the world around you. It can be the environment. Um, but I think in many ways, students feel a call to do something to support and to strengthen that sense of community. The other thing I've noticed, uh, in this show, I feel, as you know now, that I'm a New Yorker and for many, many, many years and much of my character and interest. But in any case, I've also lived here a really long time. And what I see is about every seven years, small things in the society change, it changes. And uh, so one of the things I'm experiencing is the erosion or the, the, the erosion of the concept of respect for someone um, older, more educated, good at something, whatever, whatever. And um, A, am I wrong or right? And two, uh, B, um, what has replaced that if it has been replaced? 
Well, you are asking good questions, aren't you? Thank you. Uh, Appreciate that, that. No, I mean it. You know, it's funny. I grew up as a student in the young student in the 1960s and in the early 1970s. And it seemed to me that the idea of respect for authority and for elders was very much under some kind of attack as I went through uh, elementary and secondary school. Uh, and yet we re retained considerable respect for our teachers. There was no, no doubt of that. Um, but, I ex but I think I went into the world as a young adult expecting young people to challenge what their parents thought was good for them, what their teachers told them they should know, that sort of thing. I'm not sure, ironically enough, that I haven't seen students who, well, I don't know if respect is the word, but they certainly absorb or assimilate the lessons of their parents without fighting them a whole lot. And that would mean that they, they respect their teachers too. Now, I think that their parents may challenge teachers a whole lot more than they did a couple of generations ago. Um, but I'm not sure that the students disrespect them, at least in the confines and the structure of private schools. Uh, public schools may be a different matter. I'm not, I'm not competent to say. Does well, that you grew up with, what were the slogans? Never trust anybody. Over, over 30. 30. <laughs> there we were. Uh, feels good. Do it. Just do it. Exactly. Said. But in any case, how do you just not do it? Uh, how do you teach? Um, can you teach? You can require, but can you teach edited action other than threat out of goodness? The religions try to do that. Yes, they do. Um, to me, the most effective thing is, is, is when, if children come into a, an environment, a school, an atmosphere in which they see other students, particularly older ones, uh, behaving in that manner. If the older mm -hmm. students are, are, are already showing respect, they, they, the children look around and they say, and we all do. You look around at a new place, you say, oh, this is how people act. And most people adjust them, their behavior accordingly, or try to, within within limits, mm -hmm. of course. Um, there are a few perverse people who will do the opposite, but I think on the whole, they they look around and they say, "Oh, this is a place where you, you you act in this way," and they do. And what did you absorb from your home in that respect, of how to act, or from what my, were the values? From my home, uh, yes, certainly great great. Uh, interest in curiosity, interest in learning things and trying to do them well, um, not feeling that it was essential to be perfect. Um, I'm glad of that. Um, the, one of my predecessors at St. Bernard's, uh, Bill Westgate, was a very good headmaster, but he was a perfectly terrible cello player. And he used to say, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. And so sometimes I think being being an amateur, giving things a try, is a good thing. Uh, and I also think I also think being respectful, but also having a good sense of humor about things is tremendously important because children do grow up these days with a lot of stress, and it's it's good to have humor. What did you decide to teach your son, or you and your wife decide to teach your son, Stuart, by way of values? I think some of the things that that uh, I mentioned, you want them to think that learning learning is important. It's serious, but not solemn. Uh, you want him to try things that he really likes. He really liked to do, but also to give it a go if he was dealing with something that he found very difficult. Um, you can't bang your head endlessly against the stone wall, but on the other hand, you have to you have to try. You have to learn to keep trying. One of the things that I was not taught is trying to play out an idea um, and try and figure out what the unintended consequences would be in five years of whatever. And, um, or the sense that you have to evaluate <laughs> an action you've taken or whatever anybody's taken or the government's taken or whatever to see if 
it's still good, if the efficacy is good, is it just too much of it? And so proportionality or the imperfection, I guess, um, Fieldston certainly emphasized utopian <laughs> dreams. He was good um, at that, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think having that discussion in the classroom, but certainly in life, um, is something that I would, and now that I have grandchildren, I try to, even though they're very young, um, uh, six and seven, I try to get them to think about that, even though it's a little young, um, because um, things are often presented with certainty. And um, being one that's personally curious, very curious, uh, I think reserving that I won't call it skepticism, but the desire to know more, or even myself, if I have an opinion on something, I mentally take the other point of view <laughs> just to see where I could be wrong or what the, I don't know, it entertains me anyway. And uh, to be f able to do that, I think is very helpful. You don't have to like the other point of view, but you have to understand it. Uh, and the benefits, at least, people believe in. So I hope some of that is now taught in the schools um, or a school that you've been associated with. That is a very good, good point. Um, unintended consequences is, I think, a lesson that's hard for lots of people to learn. Um, certainty is certainly easier for young children to expect but they learn very early on that they don't always get what they want and certainly what they expect. Uh, it may be hard for them to see around corners and see much, much into the future. Uh, that's, that's very much a learned uh, talent, I believe. So you may have to give them a certain amount of certainty, even if you don't believe it. Um, but there's no doubt that as they get older and uh, heading towards adolescence, I think it is important for them to see that things are ambivalent and tricky and not always predictable um, because they know it too and they experience it more and more as in their lives as they grow older. It's a, it's a, it's a good quality, but living with uncertainty is, is not easy for a lot of us and it's something that children certainly have to learn. Can you teach um, depth of perception as a teacher? Yes, I think so. Again, it comes with time and age and, you know, some mistakes and all that sort of thing. But you can, you can help students see that things are not so, not so easy. I think discussing literature is, is a great way to do it and interesting books and poems and plays, because that's where perceptive, perception or perceptiveness um, is, is really laid out for for analysis and for understanding. And it's something they, they can read about and then perhaps they can try to imitate it or or develop it on their own as they get older. But it's a lot. What made you a good teacher? I don't know that I ever was a good teacher, but I really enjoyed working with children and understanding that there was, every child is different and needs his own or her own uh, line of communication and having, having fun with them, even when it wasn't easy. Uh, and I think that, that connection is essential. It's a real, it's a vital spark. How do you develop it? Oh, well, I think you have to like young people, and, but you also have to be always working on it as you teach in the act of teaching. You modify what you do because you see it's not working or, you see it's working for some and not for others. And so you have to find another, another approach for that boy or girl. It takes a long time, but it has to be something you enjoy doing. Is that true about being a headmaster or head of school too? It has to be moderated and it, and it takes a long time to learn? Oh, I think so. I mean, you make a hundred mistakes a day, don't you? Or maybe 150 and you just hope you make them less badly or fewer fewer mistakes the next the next day but yes absolutely the great thing about 
not moving from teaching to administration is you come to appreciate that what everybody does in a school is essential to make it work. Um, and as a teacher, you think, well, you're the, you're the savior. You're the one who's going to rescue these children, either individually or in the lump, and make them, you know, members of the human race. And then as you, you realize it's a lot more complicated than that. They have parents, they have all sorts of influences around them and outside the school that are beyond your ability to touch. But you also appreciate all the different people who can, who can make contributions and inflections. As social media became such a factor in our lives, how has that affected your role? I tried to discourage it. Um, I think it's become, it, I don't deal with it much myself, but I do know that it's, it's extremely important for a lot of young students and also for younger teachers. And you have to help them see that that is not the way to see the world in terms of likes or dislikes or how many people you have in your fan base, that kind of thing. Being your own person is extremely important and it shouldn't just be in the reflections of other people, particularly through that, the, that medium. Do you think people, uh, kids raised in the suburbs or surrounding New York have, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not searching for a, a sort of a, I call a different beat than city kids? Well, I'll find out, won't I? I'm just starting. <laughs> right, <with> that. That's <laughs> true. But I of, I, of course, always thought so. I think that New York children are, can be quite glib. And it's not exclusive mm -hmm. to them, of course, but they're very good talkers. And sometimes they have been less exposed to doing things, except in very structured ways. They go off to their karate class or they go play whatever instrument they play or they have religious instruments, whatever it is. Uh, but I do think that the chance just to go out and try different things and do do things that's, that aren't necessarily laid out for you in your daily schedule by your parents is pretty confining or pretty limiting. But boy, can they talk well. <laughs> and at what age would you say people or ch kids are ready to try things? Well, you hope all like the time. Like just what you said, you know, sports, you know, music, yeah. dance, whatever. Well, the younger the younger the better, but I do think that if it's if it's thrust down their throats, they will, or if too many things are thrust down their throats, they will they will regurgitate it. Let's put it that way. So the, it is important to find things that they really do like, and uh, let them and let them do those. But then also a few things that maybe they don't. I mean, that piano lesson isn't such a bad thing, even if by fifth grade he's had enough of it. So what do you do to refresh yourself since you're going to be and have been a very public person within the school? Schools. Schools, well, uh, it's enjoyable to see people, but it's also a little privacy is, is never a bad thing. Uh, very important when you're in an office all day to get out and exercise. Teaching is quite aerobic. You know, you really, you, I think you burn a lot of calories in a classroom. Um, so it's important to get, get that kind of exercise. And I think reading is tremendously important. I really do think that that's the way in which you, you refresh your mind, your, your mind and get all kinds of ideas. And remember that you're not only in this little world of a school. What kind of books appeal to you? All kinds. I certainly like, like fiction, um, classics, and, but I also, it's very important to read about history and about people and the world and also things that might be speculative or cosmological even. I read those less than the others, but. I also read a lot and I, I think it's the fault of my curiosity because it's full spectrum. And I like, I actually like books where I have to look up <laughs> the meaning of a word. That's a good um, thing. But uh, it, that's an odd pleasure. It's um, a very good pleasure. I I say the children need to learn how to use a dictionary for just that reason. Oh, right. <laughs> that in the phone book, I tell the family, these are artifacts of an earlier time. Yes. <laughs> Save them. Yes. <laughs> you know, just to learn how the rest of us function. Yeah. So right. much, uh, even going to a library, just sort of wandered around and yeah. instead of being so specific. Uh, oh, I think browsing is tremendously it. valuable. And, and for young children, a real library with real books in it is essential. They like to read books, the things. They like the feel, the look, the smell, everything. Yeah. That's interesting. 
I'm glad you said that. I can't recall that any school my, my, has ever emphasized smell, <laughs> ever. You know, they, the, the uh, French did a survey some time ago and they asked people what they liked about books, physical books, and 42% of them said the smell. That's the French for you. <laughs> Well, good to, uh, to remember. So I want to thank you for uh, being part of the conversation here. And um, I feel we have, uh, I have learned uh, certain things from you that I'd like to comment. And that is one, the role of curiosity, one of the role of um, truth, the seeking of understanding and two that we learn, um, or two or three, that we learn differently. Um, uh, with just our conversation about smell, you just explained to me why I prefer books to online books. Uh, uh, I feel it's more of a communication. Uh, the other is just print floating by. The ideas don't register as as deeply. Anyway, the ability to handle schools, handle parents, handle everything is both a joy and a learning experience, just like you said about teaching. So wherever you are in life, the beginning, the middle, or later on, remember it's a learning opportunity. Take it all in and edit it well <laughs> and be interested, be civil, be kind, be, go out and do something kind for someone you know and don't, someone you don't know every day next week and I'll see you next time and take his advice to heart. Okay, lots of good luck to you, Stuart, in well, your new position. Uh, you, it's Lee. going to be a growth opportunity for all. <laughs> yes, you said Which is it. good. <laughs> yes, you, thank you. You summarized so much it again. better than I could. Thank you so much. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.